Okay. So this project is going to be utilizing my 3D printer. I want to turn this thing into a Sudoku solving robot. As I'm thinking through this project, the first thing I need to do is to attach a pen to the 3D printer. The next thing I'll need to do is to attach this little webcam. I'm going to need both of these things to move with the print head. To control this whole thing, I'm going to be using a little Raspberry Pi Zero. I'll capture the image of the Sudoku puzzle using the camera and then do the image processing here on the Raspberry Pi using something called computer vision. I've never used computer vision on any of my projects, so this will be a good intro to that technology. I started out by removing this little fan grill from this cooling fan and I'm going to attach the little pen mount to the little mounting holes and repurpose those. I'm hoping to design this whole thing in sort of a non-destructive way so that it can still function as a 3D printer. I've got this fitting just perfectly so that this pen will actually just kind of snap right into place. And it's pretty rigid. I've got the pen attached to the 3D printer, and now I need to use Fusion 360 to generate some G-code to write the number five. But before I do that, I need to know the height the pen needs to be at in order to write on the piece of paper. Most G-code uses something called absolute positioning. This is where you have an origin and every movement that the machine makes is based on how far away it is from that origin. For this project, absolute positioning isn't going to work and here's why. Let's say that I need to draw the number eight in a particular spot on the puzzle. If I used absolute positioning, all of the code to draw that number eight is specific to that location. I wouldn't be able to reuse that code when I need to draw that number eight somewhere else on the puzzle, so that's not gonna work. So what we're gonna do is use something called relative positioning. Relative positioning just generates g-code off of the previous position and this is going to work great for this application because I can just start in a spot and then draw out each number and I don't have to worry about the origin or anything like that. All right I'm not sure if you saw that or not but let me zoom in here. That is a number five. It has taken a long time to get to this point, um, but I've got a five written down on a piece of paper. I'm having all sorts of trouble playing around with uh, absolute positioning versus relative positioning in my G-code and doing all sorts of post-processing on the data, but I think I've got a pathway forward. I'm able to write numbers now from the computer, so I need to write a bunch of code um, so that I can start writing out numbers in specific locations. You saw how these numbers were kind of written all over the place. I know exactly what happened. I forgot to tell the pen to start and stop in the center of each number. So when I drew the number five, for example, the pen ended a little bit lower and to the left of where it started. Then it jogs over to write the number six and it's not in the right spot. So that made the numbers be all wavy, but that's an easy fix. All I need to do is add a little bit of G code so that the pen starts and stops in the center. I was just doing some testing and I sent some g-code from my computer to I think it was homing the machine and that pen that was attached to the print head got mashed into the print bed and it flew it broke apart and kind of flew across the room just like that and um, now the clicky part doesn't work anymore so that pen is toast um, luckily I've got 
a whole bunch more in the package, but I wish I would have gotten that on film because that would have been fun to show you. I've been banging my head against the wall for several days trying to get this to work. I've been writing Python scripts to generate G code that will write out the numbers on the piece of paper and I just keep running into all sorts of problems. But I think I've got something that finally works. I've written G code that will write out the numbers one through nine across the grid. And I'm gonna do a test run here on the Sudoku puzzle that's taped to the bed of the printer. Right now I'm sending the G code from my desktop computer, but eventually I'll have that running from the Raspberry Pi to the printer. Before I show you the test, obviously I'm gonna be writing over some of the numbers that are already there, but this is just a test to make sure I've got the size and the spacing right of my numbers. So first it's going to home the machine and then it should come back up to this point and start filling in the numbers. So it's homing the machine now, and then it should go up to that upper left hand corner and start filling the numbers in across the top of the row and then go down the next row and so on. This is working really well so far. You have no idea how much work it took me to get to this point, so I'm actually really happy with this progress. So it's looking like the numbers are sort of drifting lower and lower, um, so I'm gonna have to adjust that vertical spacing just a little bit, but other than that, everything looks to be pretty close. I've been working on adjusting that vertical spacing and I've got it to a point where I'm happy with it. Like I said earlier, the G code is being sent from the computer. So the next thing I wanna work on is sending that G code from the Raspberry Pi. So I've been working on the Python code and the serial port so that I can talk to the 3D printer and send that G code over the Raspberry Pi port. So let's take a quick second and talk about the bigger picture of what I'm doing here. My goal is to have the 3D printer write out the solution to a Sudoku puzzle. On the other side, I've got a Sudoku puzzle that needs solving. So what I'm trying to do is figure out all the steps in between those two things and bridge that gap. So I'm kind of starting on that 3D printer end. I've attached the pen and the camera to the 3D printer and now I'm figuring out all the steps to draw out the numbers and then from the Raspberry Pi send the right G code to write those numbers and I'm kind of just working my way across that bridge until I get to the point where I can give it an unsolved Sudoku puzzle and it'll execute all those steps that I've built in. Now that I'm at the point where I can write in whatever number I want in whichever location, it's time to start working on the Sudoku solving algorithm. Since I'm not all the way across that bridge that I just talked about, what I'm doing is I'm just hard coding a Sudoku puzzle that I've printed off from the internet in a string of numbers. And I'm using the number zero to represent the empty cells. The first thing I wanna do for that string of numbers that represents that unsolved Sudoku puzzle is to break it into columns, lines, and boxes. If you're familiar with Sudoku puzzles, you'll know what I'm talking about. Then from there, I'll go through all the empty cells and I'll assign candidates to each cell. Obviously, some of these cells will have lots of different candidates and some of them will only have one candidate. So the first thing I'll do is I'll go through and if a cell only has one candidate, that's obviously the solution to the puzzle and I'll just assign that and I'll keep going. Even with this simple algorithm of assigning candidates to each cell and checking for cells that only have one candidate, you can solve a lot of Sudoku puzzles this way. Most of the puzzles that are rated as an easy puzzle can be solved just using this method. Once I've gone through the puzzle and I've eliminated the low hanging fruit, the cells with only one candidate, I'm left with cells that have multiple candidates. That means I have to look for something called hidden singles. A hidden single is a cell that has a candidate who is unique among its row or column or box. If that's the case, these hidden singles are the solution for that particular cell, so you can write those in. So this is sort of that mid-hanging fruit. This is a little bit harder to figure out, especially for a human to do, but computer is pretty good at it. The final thing to do is if once you've figured out all of the naked singles and all of the hidden singles, you really have to start doing a guess and check method. So far in my Python code, I've implemented those first two algorithms, finding naked singles and finding hidden singles. I think I'm gonna stop there for now because this allows me to solve a pretty broad range of puzzles. Later on, if I have time, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna implement that guess and check method. So I'm holding in my hand a Sudoku puzzle that's rated as an easy puzzle, but my algorithm has never seen this puzzle. So I'm at the point where I'm going to tape this to the printer bed and I'm going to manually input the numbers for now, but I'm gonna have my algorithm solve the puzzle and write in the solution. So I'm literally going row by row, left to right, and I'm inputting the numbers into my code, just hard coding this puzzle for now. So I'll do like a seven, zero, zero, 080, 010, and so on as I go all the way down. So I'm just aligning this paper with the upper left hand corner of the build plate. I can print out any puzzle from this website and the alignment will be correct because everything is placed in the same spot every time. 
All right, I'm ready to execute the Python code. So I'm gonna hit start and you can see that it's already solved the puzzle and it's opening the serial port and it'll start sending those G-code commands from the Raspberry Pi to the 3D printer. Okay, so it's filling in the first row here with the solution. And now it's moved on to the second row. I estimate that this is gonna take around two minutes to fill in the puzzle, but that's definitely still faster than you'd be able to do it by hand. At this point, I've built several of the pieces to build that bridge that I was talking about. The last major piece here is to use the camera to capture an image of the puzzle. Then I'm gonna use computer vision to process the image and extract the data off of the puzzle and then input it into the Sudoku solving algorithm. I'm not gonna give away any more than that because that's the next video in this series. I think I'm gonna do something fun. I'm going to send a Sudoku puzzle that's solved with this machine to all of the Bite Size supporting members. So if you wanna support this channel, go check out patreon.com forward slash Bite Size or click the join button below. Bite size supporting members get access to a lot of cool things. Recently, I built a self-balancing skateboard, like a one wheel, and I put a whole bunch of time and effort into documenting the process, and I put out a build guide. Bite size supporting members get access to this build guide for free, as well as all of the other build guides that I've put together. They also get access to behind the scenes content and early release videos and access to the Discord server. So if you've been watching my channel for a while and you wanna support me, that's a great way to do so. If this project inspired you to make something of your own, I'd love to hear about it down in the comments. I hope that videos like this help you take your creative ideas and break them into smaller, more manageable pieces. Thanks for taking the time to watch this video. Before we go, let me tell you about the sponsor of this video, which is Altium. Altium makes a PCB design software called Altium Designer. If you've ever done any sort of electrical design, you're gonna wanna check out Altium Designer. In my career as an electrical engineer, I've used a lot of different software, and let's be honest, most of it is crap. That is not the case with Altium Designer. It is beautifully designed, it's modern, and they're continually updating it to have the latest features. What's cool about Altium Designer is that it's an all-in-one platform. Some of the other software that I've used, you have to use different programs to do your schematic capture, and then your board layout, and then your component selection, and your netlist, and it's a huge mess. That's not the case with Altium Designer. It's all built into one package. Another cool thing about Altium is that it has cloud features. It's got something called Altium 365, which is a cloud workspace that allows you to collaborate with other people, and do version control. If you wanna get a better idea of what you can make with Altium Designer, go follow them on Instagram and there's lots of different examples of what people have made using their software. If you're ready to take your PCB design to the next level, go check out Altium Designer and you can do that by clicking on the link in the description. And when you sign up for a subscription, you'll get a 30% discount. Altium is an awesome company. They believe in what I do here on this channel and they make these videos possible. So go check them out. I really appreciate you supporting the sponsors and I appreciate Altium for sponsoring this video.